But I'm excited to teach, and I'm so excited to teach that typically I write about six pages. That takes me about an hour to preach. I did 10 pages this week. <laughs> so I was like, all right, Gab, we got to whittle this down. So I'm hoping that I can get across what I want to in a timely fashion here. Um, but we are going to look at uh, the this saying of dumb things Christians say this week, and the particular saying we're looking at this week is forgive and forget. Now, One moment. I'm a little bit nervous that uh, I might have had my wife print off. Oh boy, the f the wrong message. Wouldn't that be a wouldn't that be a trip, huh? Yeah. All right. That's a little bit difficult. Now, right, here's what we're going to do. Um, go ahead, hey, Mitchell, can you go ahead and bring me up that uh, laptop? I'm going to preach from a laptop this morning. It'll give me a chance to drink coffee nervously. So go ahead and bring that laptop up for me. This is what happens when I take two weeks off. Thank you, my friend. Yes, look at this. The tech team's already earning their weight in their paychecks. We don't pay you at all, do we, tech team? All right. Well, let's see how this works. I've never done this before. Um, first time for everything. Uh, aren't you glad that you don't go to a fancy mega church that has things that are put together where people know what they're doing? Instead, you get wrong sermons and guys that don't know how to do anything, and we skip things and we go late. Yeah, it's wonderful. All right. I no, I, I do want to say uh, this is not my wife's fault. This is my fault. I did. I emailed her the wrong sermon. So this is what happens when you write three different versions of the same sermon because you can't whittle it down to the right amount of pages. You don't know which one to email her in the morning. Okay, well, let's, <laughs> let me try this differently here. All right, this makes more sense. All right, so <laughs> we're going to dig into this saying, forgive and forget this morning. And uh, what I want to do is I want us to figure out and ask ourselves, just really honestly, is this a saying that we as Christians should follow, right? Um, I want to approach this subject this morning by examining it, by looking at four different questions about this saying, all right? Uh, the first question I want to look at is right here up on the screen, and that is, do we have to forgive, okay? The second thing that I want to ask this morning is, what does forgiveness look like? Then I want to dig into, do we have to forget? And then lastly, I want to close this morning by looking at, is forgetting going to be problematic? Now, church, my, my hope for you guys throughout this entire series um, it's not simply to get you guys to stop saying things. That, that's really not my main goal. That's very superficial. Um, <clears throat> what I'm hoping that we're doing during this series is we're challenging the beliefs that you are holding to that are causing you to say these things or challenging the beliefs that you hold to about God, about salvation, about biblical faithfulness that's causing you to embrace these sayings when they're said to you. Now, my prayer this week, though, is that you guys would grow in the knowledge of what healthy forgiveness is, and along with that, I would hope that you walk away better equipped and better enabled, and I hope more motivated to respond with proper forgiveness when you are offended. Now, if, if that works for you guys and you see where you're going, we can up and down, north and south it with your heads, and then I can rock and roll and get going like nothing awkward happened at all, okay? Does that work? Good. All right. It was, I gave you the wrong sermon. I had like four for the same one. All right. So uh, now before we dig into these four questions, what we do need to do is I think it would be wise and prudent for us to spend just a very short amount of time digging into the background um, or the origin of this statement, okay? Where did this statement come from, forgive and forget? Now, unlike some of the other sayings that we have looked at during this series, uh, this phrase or this dumb thing that Christians say, this actually comes from Scripture, okay? Now, albeit maybe not the best interpretation of Scripture, but this does have its genesis in Scripture. Um, there seems to be uh, at least, you know, a few verses that 
give this statement credence or credibility. Uh, let me read you the two that are typically used to support this. The first one is going to be found in Isaiah uh, 43, 25, and uh, you can read it up here. It says, I am he, so this is God talking, who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Now here it comes. I will not remember your sins. Now the second verse people seem to use to uh, give credence to the statement is found in Jeremiah 31, 34. And that says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Okay. Now this verse is actually quoted, the Jeremiah verse, it's quoted by Paul in Hebrews. He actually uses the same one as he's talking to the Hebrew church to encourage them about God's, maybe we, you know, if you want to, if you read it this way, his quote unquote forgetfulness. Now right off the bat, here's a problem, man. Um, scripture, just from what I've read already, it seems to give some validity to the idea that we should forgive and forget, doesn't it? I mean, we read that God, in his grace, proclaims that he's not only going to forgive us, but we read here, it seems like he's saying he's going to forget our sins, right? And as Christians, what are we called to do? Well, we're called to emulate Jesus, aren't we? Christians should emulate Jesus. Jesus is God. Therefore, we emulate God. And here we're seeing God saying that he's forgetting sin. So, ipso facto, we should then probably do the same is kind of what a lot of people and a lot of pastors who have preached about this um, seem to, to believe. Now, how does this jive with the fact that we're saying this is a dumb statement? Because right now it seems like maybe this has completely destroyed any idea that we should do anything other than forgive and forget. Um, now, I'm not going to address this right now. Uh, I just kind of want to leave this tension here for a bit because we're going to come back to these verses. We're going to examine them in detail later on in our message. Until then, I just kind of want you to sit in this discomfort, wrestle with this, and then we'll get to it in a little bit, okay? Um, now, personally, I do think that my life uh, would be a lot better if I was able to simply forgive and forget. Maybe you guys would agree with me. Um, I also think my life would be a lot easier if people would do the same thing to me, right? Like, uh, Pastor Kevin, no, he's never offended me or said something stupid to me or hurt my feelings. Like, I would love that. You know, no, Pastor Kevin's never preached a terrible sermon. He's an amazing guy. I would love that if people would simply forget every bad thing I did. Uh, but again, as the title of our series states, this is not all about wise sayings of Christians. These are dumb sayings of, of, of Christians. So the spoiler alert, if, uh, you know, not to ruin the whole sermon for you guys, but this probably isn't a true statement, right? Um, this statement, though, is telling us to do two things. And we need to figure out what part is true, what part is not, um, or if any of it is. Uh, the first thing we're being called to do in this statement is what? To forgive, right? Forgive and forget. So the first thing this statement is commanding or asking us to do is to forgive. And then the second thing it's asking us to do or commanding us to do or telling us to do is what? Forget, right? So first it's calling us we need to forgive, and then it's telling us we need to forget. Um, so the first two questions this morning, so we've got four of them. The first two we're going to deal with the first call, the call to forgive. The last two things we're going to look at as we uh, get to the last half of our sermon is going to be on the call to forget. So that's how we're going to break it up. Does that make sense? going to try to organize this a little bit so you guys can kind of walk through it and then we can determine for ourselves what do we do with this statement. So let's jump right into our first one, which is do we have to forgive? Now, this seems like a no-brainer. I feel like I'm insulting your intelligence even by talking about this. Um, but I do believe we should still at least take a look at God's word uh, because I know a lot of people that would say, Pastor Kevin, of course we know that the Christian should forgive. I think there are a lot of people, I mean, I would say the majority of Christians, even non-Christians would say, yes, the Christian is called to forgive. But I think a lot of us give lip service to the concept of forgiveness, the command of forgiveness. But in practice, we don't really do it. We, we hold to bitterness. We hold on to resentment. We form grudges. So what I want to do is I want to start off by looking at a piece of scripture in Matthew. All right, Matthew's gospel. If you want to turn to it, we'll have it up here on the screen. But it's Matthew 18, and we're going to look at verses 21 through 22. So if you want to go ahead and pull that up for me, thank you. What we have happening here is we have the author, Matthew, recording a particular event where one disciple by the name of Peter is approaching his rabbi, Jesus, and he's asking him about the doctrine of forgiveness practically so he can apply it to his life. And what he says is this. He says, Peter approached him and asked, Lord, 
how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And he says, as many as seven times? And then Jesus answers. Jesus says, I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Now, it might read a little different depending on your translation. Now, the first question I asked myself when I read this, I don't know about you guys when you hear it right now, but my first thing is, why is Peter asking about seven times? Like, why that number? Like, hey, Jesus, it's got to be seven times you forgive me. Like, where did he come up with the number seven? Now, uh, it's very possible, I think, that what's happening here is Peter is actually recalling a previous teaching that Jesus gave to him and some other people. And you're going to find that previous teaching uh, right here on the screen. And this is in Luke's gospel, and it's Luke 17, 3 through 4. And this is a time uh, prior probably to Matthew recording this where Jesus says, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if re he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you, check this out, seven times in a day, turn to him, and he turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So what I think is happening here is it seems like Peter is getting a little bit of clarification in this statement, right? Um, Jesus, are we really supposed to be that generous? Seven times, and if you're like Pastor Kevin... Seven times ain't generous. <laughs> I forgave my spouse seven times for the same thing last week, you know. But you got to realize if you, um, if you look at ancient rabbinical teachings, um, going back to I think the earliest we find this is in the third century, there was uh, teachings that we've uncovered where Jewish rabbis would teach that the limit of forgiveness was three times. Sin one time, cool. Do it to me a second time, cool. Three times, you're right out. So Jesus is saying seven. That's pretty generous. You know, as a, as a Jewish rabbi, which he was, he's not only doubling, but he's adding one on when he does this teaching in Luke. So Peter here is like, hey, Jesus, are you sure this is, are, just want to make sure, are we to be this generous with our forgiveness? But if you notice, Jesus never said the limit was seven. What did he say? He says, if someone sins against you seven times, and they come to you and ask for forgiveness seven times, you forgive them. He's not saying seven's the limit. What does he say the limit is there in Matthew? He goes 70 times seven. So for those who want to keep track, that means we only need to forgive someone 490 times. The 491th time, you can just get right out of town because I've reached the jesus limit for you and your bull crap in my life. Um... <laughs> Hopefully you don't take that seriously. But people do get hung up on this number, this 70 times 70. Well, how many is it exactly? And, and I think the reason why people want to know an amount, why does Peter want to know an amount? Why do people want to, why do we want to know? Well, what is the real number for 70 times 70? It's because in our heart, we do want to know, when do we get to finally say, yeah, you're done? Like we do, that's the heart of it. You're not saying, well, I'm just trying to be educated. Don't pull that crap on me. We, I know because I'm that way. I want to know what I can be like and done. Get out of here. Jesus says 70 times 70, man. Now, what's happening here is 70 times 70 is a really cool thing. 70 times 70 is actually not something that Jesus makes up on the spot. What he's doing is he's going back to Genesis 4. And in Genesis 4, there's a story of a dude named Lamech. Lamech is like, he's... He's a dirtbag, all right? And what, what, what's happening here is there's a phrase that Lamech uses, that Jesus uses here, and we call this type of, of um, recalling and using, we call this a metalepsis. All right, it's a really cool thing. Look it up. Um, but what's happening here is Jesus is using a metalepsis that the disciples would have understood as students of uh, the Torah as kids, so they would have recalled that 70 times 70 is something from the story of Lamech. And in that story, and I, it's a sermon for another time, and I don't have time to get into it, um, so just we'll get back to it some other day. Um, but Lamech is this vengeful, unforgiving dude, and he talks about how his wrath or his vengeance is unlimited. So what Jesus here is really trying to do is say, dude, it ain't about seven times. It ain't about 490. It ain't, it's about unlimited, limitless forgiveness. He's telling us that forgiveness should be limitless. And that really screws with hearts of flesh like mine and maybe yours, right? So here's the deal, man. Um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of scriptures as we're looking at, do we have to forgive? There are so many scriptures in the New Testament and the Old Testament that tell us, yes, we are to forgive. There are oodles, oodles. There's a cornucopia 
of scriptures that tell us that forgiveness is a mark of saving faith. There's still many other scriptures that tell us that if you don't forgive, you are not truly going to be, uh, you, you have no right to claim that you're a Christian. So you wonder, well, Pastor Kevin, why don't we talk about those, you know? Do we have to forgive? Why don't we go through all those scriptures that tell us? Why talk about this one about unlimited forgiveness? It seems like maybe we're missing an opportunity here. But see, I, I, I don't think just pouring over the dozens of scriptures that say, see church, the Bible says forgive, the Bible says forgive. I don't think that's the best use of our time with this. Because I, I believe the majority of, of the Christians that are here this morning, you understand that God commands you in his word to forgive. We get that. I don't think for a second a Christian disagrees with that. What I believe we struggle with is the idea of extending forgiveness in a limitless sort of way. I think that's our bigger issue. Okay? Um, see, we get the need to forgive, but when that person has done that thing to you over and over and over and over, right? And over. When they are to us, as we might call them, a habitual offender, our flesh kind of raises up and attempts to say, you know what, that's it. I'm done, no more. I can't keep forgiving you. We get to the point where we feel justified saying, this far, my friend, but, but no more. Yet here Jesus is saying that the Christian is called to say, this far and farther. I think that's a more impactful scripture for us to look at when we wonder, do we have to forgive? Not the commands to forgive. We know that. I think it's, we need to realize that there's a command to say, you can go this far and forgiveness will continue. Forgiveness is limitless. It's selfless. It's grace that's given to undeserving people. And I think a lot of us today need to hear that that's what forgiveness needs to look like if we are to say that we are followers of Christ um, we want to be told, and I get it, man. I think a lot of us want to be told, hey, you're justified withholding eventually. I've also heard Christians say this question. I've had it as a pastor. Pastor Kevin, but if they don't ask for forgiveness, we don't have to forgive them, right? And I, Maybe you've done that too. I know I have. Early on in my walk through, like, hey, if, if they don't ask for forgiveness, do we have to? And here's a question. I don't, I don't answer that with a yes or no. I say... I think I think there's a bigger issue here. I think there's a hard issue when we ask these questions. Because once again, I think what's happening here is you, you are asking because you want to know that you're justified harboring unforgiveness towards someone. The question shouldn't be, if they don't ask for forgiveness, do we have to forgive them? I think the question should be, if they don't ask for forgiveness, how do we still forgive them? That should be the question we ask, right? That's how it should be. So let's take a look at do, uh, what does forgiveness look like. Okay, What does forgiveness look like? Now, I've, I've heard forgiveness defined a lot of different ways. Maybe you have two. Um, I'll give you the dictionary definition. Uh, pretty solid. Dictionary defines forgiveness as to give up resentment of, uh, to give up resentment or claim to requital. To give up resentment or a claim to uh, requital, which basically means payback. Okay? So you're just giving up your right um, or giving up your claim. But biblically, uh, forgiveness is a little bit different. Typically, um, forgiveness is oftentimes used in financial sense. Uh, forgiveness is typically used in the Bible to describe a release or a dismissal of something. Right? A release or dismissal of something. Oftentimes, as I said before, it's, it's uh, referring to a moral debt or a financial debt. That's how the Bible typically uses the word forgiveness. And I like that. I think that's way better. See, forgiveness is, it's an act whereby the one who is owed something, whatever it might be, willingly chooses to release the individual from their debt against them. Did you catch that? Let me repeat that in case you didn't. Okay, because this gives us our first glimpse into what forgiveness is and what forgiveness isn't. Let me repeat this one more time. All right. Forgiveness is an act whereby the one who is owed something, are you with me? An act whereby the one who is owed something willingly chooses to release the individual from their debt against them. Did you catch a key word that I said there? Willingly chooses to release the individual from their debt. 
See, forgiveness is first and foremost, church. It's an act of volition, right? It's an act of your will, volition. Willingly chooses to do something. See, forgiveness, my friends, is a cognitive decision that someone makes to exercise their own free will, and in doing this, they choose to release another from what they are justly owed. That's huge, guys. That's massive. I, some of you guys, you need to slow down on grasses because this is, uh, if you're struggling with forgiving someone this morning, this could be your, your freedom key here. See, forgiveness is an act of volition. It's a cognitive act of volition whereby you are exercising your own free will to release someone. I say that because you need to hear this really clearly. Forgiveness is not an emotional response. Forgiveness is not an emotional experience. Forgiveness does not find its basis in your emotions. See, a lot of people withhold forgiveness, and I've been here too, all right? We withhold forgiveness because we say, hey, dude, I can't forgive that person because I'm still hurt. I can't forgive that person because I'm still mad about it. I can't, I'm not ready to forgive you yet because I'm still really just ah, inside about this situation. I don't like it. I, I, I can't forgive you yet because I haven't made peace with what happens. They're trying to forgive as if forgiveness is an emotional thing. But that ain't what forgiveness is, yo. Not even close. See, forgiveness is not about feeling good about what was done to you. I think we think that sometimes. You know, you got to make peace with this situation and forgive them. What does one have to do with the other? This is nonsense. See, forgiveness is not about liking what someone did to you. Uh, forgiveness is, is not about getting to a point where you can dismiss um, the harmful actions and get this warm and fuzzy towards your oppressor or your attacker, man. See, rather forgiveness, once again, it's about making a conscious decision to exercise your free will and release an undeserving, that's very clear, an undeserving person from a debt that they owe you. Right? Does that make sense? You got to realize this is not about feeling good about what was done. Sin is wrong. And that's, that's okay to say that. Sin is objectively wrong. Sin is objectively evil. I believe everyone here has probably had someone sin against them. Amen? Yes? If you, if you haven't, you, are the, the, you, you live a wonderfully ignorant, oblivious life, and I would love to be in your shoes. Um, but we've all had someone sin against them. Maybe even it happened this morning and you're sitting here thinking about what that person did right now. You're like, oh, thank you for helping me recall that memory, Pastor Kevin. Yep, I can picture it now and I'm shooting daggers at them in my head, right? We think about what that person did. We think about how evil and immoral and how unjust that thing was. And maybe rightly so, right? It was unjust. It was evil, objectively. And in this moment, as you're thinking about that person and what was done to you, you know, and you got that unforgiveness in there, and maybe you don't feel comfortable with it, but you're like, oh, it's there, you know, let's be real. Um, you're, you're directing all your anger at that individual. Right? And in your head, you're like, man, that piece of blankety blank. I just they think they're so self-righteous and they think they're so good and I can't believe they had the audacity to do that to me and they think they're so perfect. You know, we put that person in our crosshairs when the real enemy is sin. We put that person right in our crosshairs. Yeah, I'm going to think about them. And the real enemy is the sinful action. See, the real source of weakness, it's not your wife, it's not your husband, it's not your co-worker. It is a sin that that individual did. And, and sin is wrong all the time. Sin is evil, and we have every right to be pissed off at the sin. We should be mad at the injustice of sin, the impact of sin, and the overwhelming destructive power of sin. We should hate the sin, and we should always refuse to accept sin as okay. And we have every right to be vehemently angry at sin and unrest and turmoil at sin. 
But where we get stuck is we feel that to forgive someone, we have to feel good about the situation. We have to feel good or okay or at peace with what was done. And my friends, that is the biggest load of crap I have ever heard. That's ludicrous, foolish, illogical, and impossible, and unbiblical. Amen? See, we can forgive the perpetrator of the action while simultaneously condemning the sin that they did. Do you catch that? We have every right to release someone and forgive them while condemning the sin is sin. Those two things can happen at the same time. Actually, biblically, they should. We can love the offender while simultaneously hating the sin that came from said offender. See, forgiveness is recognizing and acknowledging the sinfulness of sin, the depth of the debt, the extent of the hurt, but then releasing the individual, the anger that you have towards the act or the sin itself. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. We can love the offender while simultaneously hating the sin that came from them, because forgiveness is recognizing the sinfulness of sin, the depth of the debt, the extent of the pain, and then releasing the individual of the anger you have towards the action. I'm going to release you of the hate that I have towards your action, and I'm going to direct my hate at the source of it, which is the sinfulness and the enemy and that corruption. So hopefully you get that, guys. But I want to encourage you, re-watch this sermon like 18 times if you need to this week because I think this is going to take some time to digest. This is uh, sometimes um, pain and hurts have run deep and it's going to take a little bit to, to wrap your head around this concept. Now, on the topic of revisiting this sermon and giving yourself some time to digest this message, I would also say that um, the same thing can be said for, for forgiveness. Um, it takes some time to to make this happen. See, there's this uh, false idea, especially in churches and books and sermons and all this stuff and, and, and uh, just kind of in the world around us, that um, after we forgive someone, you know, after we choose to release an individual the debt that they owe us and that we willingly choose, according to what it is, right, an act of volition, that after we willingly choose to respond to the person with the undeserved love, the unmerited grace and compassion, that if the next day or the next week down the road, we start having negative thoughts about them, then somehow we probably didn't forgive them. Right? Or maybe forgiveness didn't work. Like it's some magic spell or incantation and, and it, you know, I did the thing and I'm still angry. Forgiveness didn't work. We think that a lot and we beat ourselves up. What's wrong with me? Why, why did I not forgive them? The, you know, and why didn't it work? And I've been there many times. Um, I think a lot of us were taught that forgiveness is a one-time event, which is obviously backed up by our saying this morning, forgive and forget. We, we forgive, we forget. Boom, it's over. One-time event. And when all of a sudden the hurts and the pains come back up and we get mad at the person, we're like, ah, oh, it didn't work. What did I do wrong? I didn't pray hard enough. But the truth is forgiveness is not a one-time event. Forgiveness is not a one-time event. Rather, forgiveness is a repetitive action that needs to continue and should continue as long as necessary. We revisit it over and over. Let me give you an example. Um, I share my past pretty openly with you guys. I share um, my hurts, and I try to be vulnerable with you guys from the pulpit. Sometimes it might make some of you guys uncomfortable, but I do this because I, I want you to realize that in the context of a church body, we need to be able to be vulnerable with our hurts and with our past, right? I, I share all the time the dirt that I did, the screw-ups that I've made. Um, so I, I don't ever share things just to be cessational. Um but I, I, hopefully it can be something practical and, and it can cause you guys to do the same. But um, I'm pretty open about the fact that uh, from age 12 to 17, I was sexually assaulted and molested by a grown man. It was a very traumatic experience. Um, and that's a hard thing to deal with as a kid and, and even as an adult, you know, the memories. And it's a hard thing to get past. Um, and it caused me to be a very violent, aggressive person that hurt people um, in violent manners. Uh, your pastor has a pretty rough background. Um, but it wasn't until I experienced forgiveness from Jesus for my own sins that I was finally able at age 29 to forgive this individual uh, for what he did to me. And I remember the day that I was praying, um, and I, I remember very clearly the day that I finally verbally, um, privately in prayer, I verbally released this man 
from uh, the debt that he owed me. I was able to forgive him. Uh, it felt, it, it did feel great, guys. I tell you, that was a wonderful time to finally be able to do that. A lot of tears, a lot of snot. Um, but I, I loved it, man. You know, it felt great. It felt freeing. But guess what? When I woke up the next morning, his face popped in my head. And my first thought was I wanted to have him bite the curb and curb stomp him, you know. And I don't say that to be graphic. I want you to understand that was the depth of the anger that I had. You know, I had murderous anger. I, I knew that if I ever saw the person, I, there was a solid possibility that I was going to uh, murder them. I had a lot of anger. That's how strong that hurt was. After I forgave him the, the, as a Christian. So guess what I did? I had to forgive him again. <laughs> And this was a process. It was almost like every day I'm like back to forgiving the guy. And then after a while, it became like every week I would forgive him. Then every month I would forgive him. And eventually it was like every year. And now, by the grace of God, it's been like five, six years. I've just been at peace with this. Not at what happened, but at peace with the individual. It's crazy. Like now when I think about this dude, um, I, I have no ill will towards him when I think about it in my head. You know, I have no desire to harm this guy. Um, rather, I actually pray for this dude every now and then when he pops in my head. I pray for his soul because I'm grieved for him while he hurt me. I know that when he stands someday before a just holy God in, in, who, in, ha, as he's lived in rebellion to God, he's going to be in one moment overwhelmed and crushed by the guilt and the shame he's going to feel as he realizes that he's going to be sent away from the presence of God, condemned for his sin, and, and that is going to be so crushing and so painful. That's not something I would wish on anyone, not even the man who did this to me. So, like, it's been a beautiful thing where it's caused me to change the way I view the person while still simultaneously hating the debased things that happened to me. Does that make sense? Forgiveness oftentimes is more than a one-time thing. Sometimes it can be, oftentimes it's not, guys. It depends on the depth of the hurt. Does that make sense? I think that's a good way to look at what does forgiveness look like. So let's jump right into um, do we have to forgive, okay? Um, so after all of this, we see that God's word does command us, God's word does expect us to forgive, and we actually see here that forgiveness should be limitless, unlimited. Uh, we also see that forgiveness is not an emotion, but it's an act of volition, where we choose to release somebody from a debt that they owe us, and sometimes it takes repetitive times, right? So hopefully we get all this about forgiveness. We see it's biblical. The first portion of the statement, forgive and forget, yes, we should do it. What about this other portion, forgetting? Um, do we have to forget well, let's go back to the two texts I read when we looked at the background of this statement. Let's go back to Isaiah 43, 25. We can pop it up on the screen. Um, let me read that again. I am he who blots out your transgressions for, this, for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Okay, let's look at the Jeremiah one one more time to refresh your memory. Uh, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Okay, um, you can pop the next slide up for me. So scripture is telling us, not in these two, but the totality of Scripture, throughout Scripture, we're told that God is omniscient. We talk about the omnis of God, his omnipresence, right? We talk about um, his omniscience, uh, his omnipresence. When we talk about his omniscience, this means God's all-knowingness, that he is a source of all knowledge and has all knowledge. So what we learn throughout the totality of Scriptures is that God knows everything. He knows everything we have ever thought. He knows everything we will ever think. And not only does he know about our own personal thoughts and ideas, God's knowledge extends to everything that has ever happened, everything that is happening, and everything that will ever happen. Does that make sense? If we want to get really crazy with this and have our minds blown, his knowledge actually extends to everything that could happen, but doesn't happen. That, right? It's, that's crazy. So let's just think about that logically, right? Since God possesses within himself all the knowledge, not simply of the world, but all the knowledge of all creation, every possibility of creation, and since to be God, he must know all things, 
Otherwise, that would make him limited and subject to something greater, therefore making him not God. It is illogical and it is impossible, friends, for God to forget anything. It would be self-contrary to his very nature. Does that make sense? Did you follow that train of thought? It's a logical impossibility. If God could forget, he would not be God because he would be subject to a knowledge that is greater than himself. It's inconsistent with his character. So, apart from these two verses we looked at in Jeremiah and Isaiah, it seems like the rest of Scripture makes it clear that God's knowledge is complete, it is exhaustive, um, and he has no ability to forget, for forgetting would be impossible and um, contrary to his nature. So what we need to do to understand these scriptures then is say, okay, are they contradictory? No, we know the Bible doesn't contradict itself. We must then look at these scriptures and interpret them through the lens of all scripture. Scripture must interpret scripture, right? So we say, okay, if we know who God is and what he must do, then what do you think these mean? And when we do that, we realize that um, these two verses uh, are using metaphorical language, all right? Um, these are Jewish writers, and they're writing to a Jewish audience. All right, just understand that. These are not English people living in uh, 2020, okay? So these are Jewish writers who are writing to a Jewish audience, and the Jewish audience would have been very familiar with the use of heavy word pictures. They use word pictures frequently to describe things. Um, not only that, but when it came to talking about God, the Jewish writers would oftentimes use anthropomorphic qualities to talk about God. If you don't know what that means, it means ascribing human anthropomorphic qualities to a spiritual being, right? God is not human. God is spirit. But when you read the Jewish writers, they give him these anthropomorphic qualities like God's right hand. God doesn't have a right hand. He's spirit. Jesus does, right? They say, um, the feet of God. These, once again, are the Hebrew writers ascribing to God anthropomorphic qualities in a metaphorical way. Are you tracking with that? So when it comes to talking about how God deals with sin, they are using the human quality of forgetfulness to help the human reader understand how God deals with sin in a manner that we can grasp. Are you tracking with that? Okay? So to us, it's kind of like God has forgotten about our sins, which is a beautiful, very comfortable word picture of a God who refuses to hold our sins against us and never bring them up. Now, by no means is this teaching that God forgets. Uh, again, that would be contrary to the rest of Scripture. It goes against his nature. Um, so when Paul goes back and quotes this, to his audience, once again, Hebrews. So he's talking in Hebrews, he's talking to Jewish people. Um, he's telling the readers, hey, listen, man, um, here's what Jeremiah says. He forgets. But what he's really kind of telling these guys and how they would have understood it is that if you are in Christ, then the day you stand before the Father and you are judged, God is going to willingly choose, right? That's what forgiveness. He's going to willingly choose not to recall their sins. In that moment, rather, he's instead only going to see the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to everyone who repents and believes. So I think a better way to kind of think about this, instead of thinking that God forgets, if that kind of bothers you, is instead think, that, think of it this way. Once God forgives you and positionally justifies you, he then in a moment will choose not to ever recall your sins when he looks at you. I think that's a good way to look at it. God is going to willingly choose not to recall your sins the day that you stand before him if you are in Christ. Are you tracking with that? So in our mind, it's kind of like, man, yeah, I get that. He, he's going to forget, but I get that he doesn't forget. <laughs> right? Are you with me on that one? Okay. Um, so what we've got to realize is Jeremiah and Isaiah, these scriptures are not prescriptive for us. Rather, they are descriptive of God. That's good for us to realize. Certain verses are not always prescriptive. Some verses are simply descriptive. And these are descriptive verses. They are describing a quality of God that does not apply to us. Because we will never be in the position where we will stand before, someone will stand before us, and we will judge their eternity and have to put our son, Jesus' righteousness, imputed to them. That, that, this is a thing that God's going to do. We don't apply this to our life, okay? So first off, God is not forgetting, okay? And second off, this is not something that we are supposed to do ourselves because, well, one, he's not forgetting. Two, we do not 
stand before, uh, uh, um, we don't stand in the position of God eternally judging people, okay? But what we can get from this, because there is a wonderful lesson to be learned, might not be forgetting sins, but there is still a good lesson here. What we can get out of this as Christians is to recognize the abundant mercy that God lavishes in this moment. Um, and this should cause us to do a couple things. One should cause us to praise God for his compassion, praise God for mercy, praise God for his love, and in turn cause us to, to lavish those same things on others even when they offend us. Right? But by no means is this telling us that we're supposed to forget because it's not even saying that about God. Instead, let's look at it and say, man, this is an act of great mercy, great compassion, and then extend those same things out of the overabundance of what we've received to other people. You with me on that one? Does that make sense? So let's take a look at um, our fourth question this morning, which is, which is, which is, there it is, is forgetting problematic? Um, all right, let's kind of like go with a quick little review, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, we clearly see that scripture teaches us that we should forgive limitlessly. Uh, we get that forgiveness is not an emotional response. It's a cognitive decision where we willingly choose to release someone from debt. We get that forgiveness sometimes is repetitive. It might need to be. Do we have to forget? We find that there's no basis in scripture that God ever forgets, nor should we forget. Instead, we see that God chooses not to recall our sins against us, and in turn, we should see that mercy and that love, praise him for it, and then lavish that on others. But there still seems to be people, even though we've kind of dismantled this statement, we see that there is no scriptural basis for forgiving and forgetting. There are still people that do believe that a life of forgetting offenses done to them is the better way to live. Some people can clearly be told, hey, listen, the Bible doesn't say that. They're like, yeah, but I think it's just good practice to forgive and then forget. Um, and that's found our way into the church. It's found our way out of the church. Um, it, and uh, it is all over the place in our culture today, and it has been for a long time. Now, I'm not really shocked when I find things over. Kind of, hey, can you slow down with the with the slides there, high speed? Why don't you keep on keep going back? Go back. Don't no. God, there you go. Wait for me, Mitchell. Come on. <laughs> don't use my sermon against me i'm convicted enough this morning dude i'm not surprised by crap i find on the internet i like i know the internet's filled with some weird stuff um it's a sermon for another time uh if you're counting, that's two sermons for another time so far um but i was kind of shocked when i was uh doing the old Google on forgive and forget. And I, I was surprised by how many scholarly articles that were written by um, human uh, behavioral specialists, psychologists, and experts in, in the field of, of, um, of thought on the topic of forgive and forget. Let me just kind of show you some of them. Here's one of them I found. Uh, this is, of course, on Oprah's website, so you know it's going to be true, and probably that means half of America believes this, but it's on how to forgive and forget. And then I found another one, which I thought was kind of cool, on Oprah's website, because I'm just like, well, now I'm going down the rabbit hole. And then I found eight ways to forgive and forget. I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. So there's like eight steps that I could use to be able to forgive and forget. But then I was like, is there something better? Four ways to truly forgive. I'm like, well, eight's right out the door. That's half the steps and the same impact. I was like, dare we try for more? And then I found this one. Three steps to forgive. I'm like, well, this is where it's at. There is no two steps or one steps. So according to, you know, this one, you can do this in three easy steps. Um, and then I found some other stuff, go ahead, and I saw that there's books that I could buy on how to forgive and forget, and then this book I found, which I was shocked, 400,000 copies have been sold in America. 400,000 people have read this book and, and have chosen to follow the idea that we can forgive and forget. So, you know, even though scripture is clear, there's still a lot of people that follow this. Now, I always tell you guys, the pulpit is never a place to teach opinions or thoughts, right? My thoughts and opinions are stupid, and they have no place here in the pulpit. This is a place where God's word should be taught, God's word should be examined, God's word should be consulted, and God's word should be expounded upon. Amen? 
Okay, if you want topical sermons about opinions and life and stories about grandbabies, this ain't the church for you, okay? Um, I just, I can't do that. But sometimes, though, I will say, sometimes there are ideas uh, people in the world have that are absolutely so stupid that we really don't even need to open up the Bible. We can use things like logic and common sense and dismantle them. And I'll be like, well, Pastor Kevin, hard to find people that have common sense and logic nowadays. Listen, I get you. But there are times where I'm like, I don't even need to consult the Bible. This is just stupid. You just use common sense, and you can see that. I think the idea of forgetting is one of those things that we just use a little bit of logic and common sense. We're like, dude, I don't even need to waste my time opening the Bible and risk a paper cut. I can just tell you this is a dumb idea. Um, let me give you an example. Batman, all right? Case in point, Batman. You're like, Pastor Kevin, I know you said you're going to step away from the Bible. Did you have to go this far? Yes, I did. Um, Batman experienced trauma when he was eight years old. A guy named Joe Cool, yeah, I even know the guy. Joe Cool uh, murdered Batman's parents outside the opera theater at age eight, thus turning him into the caped crusader. The rest of his life was spent on doling out justice in the shadows. And no one would ever tell Batman, hey, Batman, man, just forgive and forget. Just let it go. Like, you don't tell it to Batman, you get your butt kicked, right? It's, it's ludicrous to think that Batman would forget that he watched his mom and dad get murdered in front of him at the age of eight. Here's what I say to this. See, although that's a comic, um, that kind of ugliness does happen uh, every single day in our world. Um, and do we seriously expect to look a mother in the eye whose young child was just killed by a drunk driver in a car accident and tell her, hey man, just forgive and forget? You know? Like, do we really believe that the young high school girl should someday forget being raped at a party? Do we honestly dare to tell the Holocaust survivor who's somehow forgiven her Nazi tormentors that, man, that's great that you forgave, but you really need to forget that event in your life. Do we, we just come off the verge of 9-11 and there's people who were there and they escaped and they watched their coworkers die in horror, watching people jump out of buildings to their death to escape the flames. Do we tell them, hey, you need not only to forgive those, uh, the people that are responsible, but you got to forget that experience happened. Like, no, I mean, that's, that's stupid, all right? That, it's, it's, it's just dumb. I'm not trying to be graphic here, uh, but things like rape, murder, injustice, and abuse, they happened every minute of every day all across the globe, and these are things that no one can forget. My friends, without even opening God's word, it is easy to see that the idea of forgetting is not only illogical, but it is impossible for some of the wounds that are so deep that they scar us. Sometimes we can forget things, and it's great, but oftentimes it is a wound that is too deep to ever forget. But I do want to open the Word of God, and I want to answer the question of if it was possible to forget, or in the event that it can be, is that beneficial? Or as the question raises, is it problematic? Um, the first scripture that comes to mind that I want to share is uh, Matthew ten sixteen, and uh, where Jesus is instructing in Matthew ten sixteen uh, the twelve apostles. He's about to send them out on short term mission trip. Okay. And uh, he says in this verse, right before he sends them out, he says, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Okay, uh, So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. I love this. You want to know how to act as a Christian? This is it. All right? This is cool. See, the world then, in the first century, uh, Palestine, Judea, it was no different than the world today. The world hasn't changed. Okay? Um, it was still filled, just as it is now, with injustice, with evil. It was filled with sinful people and hurt people who then in turn hurt other people, as well as sinful people who intentionally attacked Christians in the faith they proclaimed. That's been happening all throughout history. Okay? That's just how it is, man. So Jesus, knowing this, he instructs these 12 dudes as they're going out with the gospel message. He says, listen, be gentle, be harmless, be pure of heart like a dove. Again, this is symbolic, right? The dove still to this day represents peace, gentleness, right? So he's saying, hey, be harmless as a dove because we want to display the love of Christ to all mankind, right? But also, man, be shrewd as a serpent. Be shrewd as a snake. Um, and he tells them to do this so that they might be able to persevere in a hostile environment. The world's a hostile place, man. Ugly, ugly, vicious, violent. And we need to be able to take care of ourselves as Christians. 
So what he's basically saying here is that Christians should always strive to be a messenger of love and compassion, but they're not to be some sort of walking doormat. Right? We're not supposed to be. That's not how it's supposed to be. And I will never be that as a pastor. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes go away from that side of aggression. Um, so what he's saying, man, is we're not to let people take advantage of us. We're to be loving and compassionate, but to protect ourselves uh, from harm. And he's teaching them then and us today that the Christian should be someone who is wise, someone who is discerning, right? That's what shrewd is. Someone who is perceptive and acts in the knowledge they have. We call that wisdom. Anything else would be foolish. So with that in mind, let me ask you this question. If you were to share this week, you go to life group, you're like, cool, total transparency. Here's what I'm dealing with. And you tell someone in your life group just like some dark stuff that you're going through. You share it with them under the guise of Christian accountability. Praise God, I hope that you do that. But that person in turn goes out that week and they start spreading your business all around town. So what do you do? Well, you, you, you throat punch them, right? That's the, no. <laughs> so you're like, dude, that, that would hurt you. That would make you angry and you'd be justified in your hurt and your anger. But let's say the next week after they do this, you come back on, you're like, hey man, uh, here's what happened. Like, dude, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, please forgive me. You extend forgiveness, which is a great thing. You can only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. But then you go, all right. So anyways, here, here's what else has happened in my life. And you start sharing it all again. Guess what that person does? They go out and they show their character by doing the same thing again to you. And then they come back, man, I'm sorry. You're like, man, I forgive you. So anyways, let me pick up where I left off. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you stupid? At some point in time, you have to be shrewd and say, there is love and grace and compassion that they don't deserve that I'm going to extend to them. But is there wisdom in maybe pulling back and realizing this brother has a weakness in this particular area? And knowing his weakness, maybe I should abstain from putting myself out there so that I can continue to be loving and dove-like, but also a little bit snake-like in the sense that I'm going to protect myself. My friends, this idea that we should be a doormat, that we should forget is, I don't think it's, it's beneficial. I think it can be problematic. What about the babysitter that constantly steals from you? Yeah, no, we'll hire you again this week. Take some more of grandma's silver. We're Christians. Forgive and forget. What about the coach that touched your kid inappropriately? Send him back out in the game. The co-worker continues to take credit for all your work whenever you have him around. Ah, I'm a Christian. Christian ain't supposed to be stupid and foolish. My friends, Scripture never tells us to forgive and forget. I think it's very problematic. We should love. We should show people undeserved grace, undeserved mercy. Lavish forgiveness. Please do. See, see people as God sees them and have a desire to see them rise above their, their frailties and their sins. But we are called to be wise in our dealings, which means sometimes loving and forgiving someone, but remembering their shortcomings and remembering their past actions so that we can keep ourselves and others around us from harm. That's okay to do. All right. Um, we're not supposed to keep a record of wrongdoing. I think that's important to, for us to realize, right? That's different than, than, that, that there's nothing sinful about that. We should, uh, I'm sorry, with remembering what happened, but we shouldn't keep a record of wrongdoing. 1 Corinthians uh, 13.5 says this. See, see, keeping a record of wrongdoing is a little bit different than just simply remembering. Keeping a record of wrongdoing is where we remember all the time someone offended us so that we can bring them back up to remind them. And that only leads to bitterness, right? You ever do that with your spouse? They do something and you're like, there it is again! You always do that to me. I'm guilty of this. This is something that um, in the last few months my wife and I have been working on because I oftentimes have kept a record of wrongdoing. I think especially over this past month that we've gotten a lot better at doing that. Um, but when, when we keep a record of wrongdoing, we are doing it with the intent to be able to use it against them. But it's simply remembering the hurt and not forgetting it. Remembering, I'm, maybe I shouldn't say the hurt, remembering the action, remembering the, the sin is not always a bad thing. Because if I recall, and I remember, 
um, my wife's sins against me. And I remember it with no bitterness. I remember her sins that she does against me with no desire to hold it against her. But I remember it for the desire to be a better leader in my household so that I can see where her weakness is and then submit to God and say, okay, God, how can I help her in this area and as her spiritual leader, encourage her in this struggle? See, that's very different than keeping a record of wrongdoing, right? One is saying, I'm going to remember what she did so I can, ah, I got you again. The other one is saying, I know that she's weak in this area. How can I lead her as my bride? I'm working on this by God's grace. I want to be better at this, okay? So there we go. Um, now, if you're wondering, well, Pastor Kevin, how do we deal with toxic people? Somebody asked me that, uh, you know, that we've forgiven. How do we know when to pull away? Listen, that's a sermon for another time, Greg. Okay, we'll get into that later. I know Greg wants to know that one. So let's, uh, we need to wrap up, guys. Um, I want to wrap up with, with just uh, on this statement, okay? Um, I'm sorry that we started late in our announcement a little bit long, but um, I'd be remiss if we didn't close by looking at one last thing, my friends. See, I can speak for oh, myself. Yeah, yeah, I... yeah. One last thing, okay? I feel like you're playing the Oscar music because my speech went too long. I like to thank, and then it's like the music. And Listen, I'm going to finish. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that we know we need to forgive. We understand we can't always forget. In some cases, forgetting can be harmful. But the question now that a lot of us might have um, is, how do we actually live like this? Because I kind of set a bar up here. Well, Scripture did, right? Like, that's where the bar is, and I think a lot of us are like, we're living down here. Like, that's, how do we do that? Like, if you were listening this morning, you're like, dude, I, I agree with everything you're saying, Kevin. I can see where it's coming from, the Bible, Pastor. But, like, how in the world do you expect me as a sinful human to do any of this stuff, right? Maybe you don't. Well, I would say for me it's hard because um, my, my flesh is vindictive and vengeful. It's not forgiven and merciful. That's my flesh. And along with that, my flesh really does desire to remember for the purpose of holding things against people. I don't always desire to remember for the, the purpose of um, emotional and physical health. Uh, maybe you can relate. Maybe you have uh, sinful flesh like me. Maybe you're Jesus. You're not. I am. Um, let me help you understand how this type of lifestyle of forgiveness is possible. See, to live as someone who walks out forgiveness faithfully, to live as someone who keeps no record of wrongdoing, you need to first experience forgiveness for yourself, my friends. Um, and if you've experienced forgiveness personally, then the way that you do this is then to recall the forgiveness you've been given. Um, if you have never experienced the act of, of uh, perfect forgiveness, then I believe trying to do this is going to be an effort in futility. Okay? And now I'm not referring to imperfect forgiveness that someone else on earth extends to you. Rather, I'm referring to experiencing and receiving and recalling the perfect forgiveness, the one that sets the bar for what all forgiveness should look like. Um, and that forgiveness is the one given by God to all creation through his son, Jesus. And scripture calls this the gospel. Now, let me help you understand what the gospel is for those of you who do have saving faith. This is what you should recall and for the, uh, so you can be someone who walks out forgiveness. And if you've never experienced forgiveness, then this is what you must accept so that you can be someone who can walk this out. So the gospel kind of uh, goes like this if you want to think of it in a way that will help you do this in your life. Um, we start with, uh, with God being the sole creator of everything that exists. Um, the gospel starts not with you, but with God. See, everything that exists, exists for him, through him. And uh, everything that exists was made for his good pleasure. And we were made not because he was lonely, but we were made um, to, uh, uh, for his delight and for us to find our greatest delight and satisfaction in him. Okay, But the problem was, instead of Creation, delighting in its creator, creation became an idol factory and creation began to chase after false gods. We've chased after false idols. Um, we as creation, uh, we've pursued other things. We've filled our lives chasing our flesh, our wants, um, our desires, our plans. We've rebelled against our creator. We've grieved God. We've rejected him. And in the process, my friends, we've broken every single law that he's laid out. Um, we've, uh, we are rightly guilty. We are legally guilty before this God. 
Um, and here's the key thing, man. This God, our God, the holy creator of all things, has every single right to judge us accordingly. He has every right to judge us as guilty. Now, this is, this is important. See, for God to be a good judge, then he must judge justly, which means he must punish us for our sinfulness. Otherwise, he's no longer a good judge, right? And the truth is, then, Everyone is judged guilty, has the right to be judged, uh, is rightly judged guilty, and therefore we are all deserving of the full, entire wrath of God poured out on us for all eternity um, with no relenting. Uh, there is nothing that we can do to earn a pardon. There is nothing we can do to work off the debt that we, pay, that we have to pay to God. And that is a very depressing, dark, and lonely thought to have. But it is truth. My friends, not only is it truth, but it's actually fair. You say, I want something to be fair. You don't want fair. You don't want fair. Now listen close. You need to know all these things I'm saying, not just cognitively, but you need to accept all of this wholeheartedly, embrace this terrifying reality, because otherwise this next part is never going to move you or compel you to be someone who extends forgiveness to others, okay? And the next part is this. Although you deserve justice, fair justice, the wrath of God. Although you owe God a legal debt that you can never repay, although God is fully justified condemning you for eternity, in an act of extraordinary mercy, um, he saw fit to offer you a pardon. He saw fit to pass your punishment onto himself, onto Jesus who has gotten the flesh, and in one moment, God the Father poured out his entire cup of wrath onto God the Son so that in one moment for eternity, justice would be satisfied so that you could, through the sacrificial death of Jesus, be pardoned and released from a debt that you can't pay back, a debt that you rightfully owe. And then, after this extravagant mercy, there's another continuously extravagant act of grace that follows. He then allows anyone who repents, believes, and submits to King Jesus to have access to eternity with him in his glorious presence. It's, it's incredible. Um, so he not only shows mercy through forgiveness, but then he shows grace through the gift of eternal life and glory. Brothers and sisters, if you are a Christian here today and you're harboring unforgiveness towards someone, if you're struggling to give them mercy and grace, I would appeal to you to remember, to reflect, and to meditate on this message of the gospel. Like, remember, reflect, and meditate on what I just laid out. Remember, reflect, and meditate on the undeserved mercy that you've been shown, the unmerited grace that you've been given, and the unconditional forgiveness that is lavished on you daily that you abuse daily. Yet still, it's never taken away. If you don't know Christ this morning, then I would implore you, if you're an unbeliever wrestling with how to forgive, um, then respond to the gospel of Christ. Because once you experience the forgiveness of Jesus for yourself, then out of the overabundance of forgiveness that you have been given, you will then be able to lavish that upon people who don't deserve it as well. Without the gospel, forgiving this way that I've taught for the last hour is impossible, friends. Does that make sense? I've never seen forgiveness uh, visually with my eyes in any more powerful way than something that happened a little while ago. I wasn't there at the cross to see the greatest act of forgiveness the world has ever seen. But the closest thing I can think of, um, of what forgiveness looks like, is a clip that I'd like to show. And I'm just going to ask you guys, I think it'll be well worth your time. It's three minutes long. Um, I'd like you to see this because I think this is a fitting way for us to close. And then I'll pray and uh, we can head out for the, for the rest of the day. Um, I appreciate your your consideration as we, we did start late, but um, let's go ahead. I want to show you what forgiveness looks like after we taught on this today. I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but 
I see. I I personally want the best for you, and I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. That officer, former police officer, walked into his brother's apartment thinking it was hers, saw his brother and shot him. That's forgiveness, my friends. I don't know if I will ever be able to witness anything that powerful in my life, but I want to be able to display that type of Christ-like forgiveness to others, and I hope you do too. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Um, for the grace that you've lavished upon this church, that it's been able to continue on into our, our third year of ministry, I would ask that you would um, not make the church well-known, but that you would make your gospel and your son well-known through us. Uh, Father, and, th and uh, one of the ways that I would just ask you that um, you would do this is through Christ-like forgiveness that these that the members of this church show to people in the community, that we would be people that forgive in such a manner that um, it is unthinkable, it is countercultural, and it causes people to be drawn to you. Father, if there's anyone in here that is desperately wrestling with unforgiveness, uh, Lord, bring them back to the gospel and what they've been given. For those who don't know you, um, Lord, lead them to the gospel and to the cross and show them the forgiveness that you offer us and let them experience that for themselves so they can then be people who walk in freedom, releasing others from the debts that are owed to them because of the love that your son gave us. Lord, thank you for the patience of my congregation, their tireless support of me. Um, renew me and encourage me to continue doing this ministry uh, in times that uh, I am weak and dry. I thank you for the support of them, for my family. Uh, we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.